guys, it's Will from Tested. I am here with another edition of the Tested Video Mailbag. This is where I answer your dumb questions from the internet on video on Tested.com on Saturday or Sunday morning, sometime on the weekend. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to get started and ask the very first question right now. Uh, this question says, Hey Will, what exactly are you using Dropbox for? I just finished listening to the podcast and Matt, did Matt drop his whole audio side recording onto the service? I play around with audio recordings and I know those things don't run small. Uh, actually we do, that's one of the many things we use Dropbox for. We use Dropbox a lot for intra office sharing. We don't actually have a file server set up in here. And when we need to trade files, we either have a couple of machines with open shares or uh, we just chuck them up on Dropbox and, and you know, it's the quickest, easiest way to share files amongst a bunch of people. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we use Dropbox for. I, Matt puts his audio recording in, uh, art from inside and outside the building, freelancer stuff, all, all sorts of stuff ends up in Dropbox. So it's an awesome service. Highly recommend you try it out. Uh, it's free for like two gigs. If you refer a whole bunch of people, you get up to another eight or nine gigs for free too. Or you can pay a pretty reasonable price to go up to 50 or 100 gigs of total storage. And then you can share folders with friends and coworkers and the like. The next question is about Max. You mentioned that due to the way the OS works, Max can slow down over time. I'm planning on using Migration Assistant to transfer my stuff from a two-year-old MacBook Pro to a new i5 MacBook Pro. Do I have to worry about any transferred stuff slowing down my new computer? Um, you know, it's a good question. I, I haven't done that many Migration Assistant transfers. It's one of the things I like about OS X is that the Migration Assistant actually works. It pulls your files across. It does everything you kind of would want it to do. I, I don't know... Um, I don't know if Migration Assistant's going to do negative things or not. I would ask the community and see what you guys think um, if you've experienced slowdown as a result of that. I do know that I brought my current MacBook Pro over, uh, my profile and all that over, and the current MacBook Pro, it's fine. It, it, you know, it was a Migration Assistant profile, and it hasn't been that slow, so um, I, I haven't noticed any kind of slowdown. So there you go. My experience has been that, no, it does not slow down, but I don't, that's not a definitive answer. The next question is, how do I run a Quake 2 server? Uh, so running a server for an older game is a little hard. The good news is that hardware requirements are really easy because even the cheapest server online or a, a, like a bad old notebook will have enough juice to run an old game server as our Quake, experiment, Quake World experiment on TNT last night uh, showed. Unfortunately, documentation for those old game servers is really, really thin in a lot of cases. So, you know, in the case of setting up the Quake World server, I had to go back and dig through stuff on the Wayback Machine and on, like, 15-year-old Planet Quake sites and stuff like that. It was a little bit tricky. Quake World, Quake 2, rather, should be a little bit easier. It's a little more modern. It was actually designed to run on Windows and Linux. It, there may even be a native OX, uh, OS X client for it. I'm not entirely certain. So, um, I mean, that's what I would say is, is just go out there, grab the software. It's going to be on id's FTP site, which is just ftp.idsoftware.com. You can browse to it in a browser and it'll open up right. And, uh, and go, for there. go from there. Uh, just give it a try. The hard part is usually figuring out which ports to forward on your router you know, to get past your NAT and uh, for forward incoming traffic from the internet into the machine. So uh, That's it. I don't remember what the ports were on Quake. It was somewhere in 27,500 as I recall. But I think it's like 510 or 27.6 or something like that. The next question is about netbooks and Linux. It says, hey, Will, my sister's Acer Aspire netbook stopped loading Windows altogether. I tried fixing it with Ubuntu, but with no success. I have limited experience with Linux, so do you know which versions of Linux is best for a netbook? Any that I, are there any that iTunes works with? So uh, basically, iTunes is not uh, Linux software. You can run Wine on it, but that doesn't work very well on netbooks because the processors are very slow. And anytime you emulate another OS, then things get slower and slower and slower down the line. So uh, running an emulator on a bad netbook is not going to do, you know, it's not going to work well. So iTunes is out on Linux. There are some utilities you can use to sync iPods, and I think even iPhones and iPod touches with on Linux, but they're a little finicky, and if your sister's not kind of nerdy and into fiddling around with things, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, the good news is what I would recommend doing is getting the Windows Restore software that came with your netbook. It's probably in the box someplace. It may be on a USB key or a, an optical drive and using that to restore uh, Windows on that notebook if she really needs, on that netbook rather, if she really needs iTunes. If she doesn't really need iTunes, 
Uh, there's a ton of uh, netbooks design, designed for netbook uh, Linux distributions available on the internet today. Uh, things like Moblin and Ubuntu Netbook Edition, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. We haven't actually tested any of that stuff since we've been here. I kind of am down on netbooks. I never really liked them very much. Uh, just because they were kind of underpowered. I mean, they're, they're interesting because they're cheap and they're, they're ubiquitous computing is always good. But, I mean, I kind of feel like the test, you guys, the guys who are reading tested don't really care that much about netbooks. So we haven't spent a lot of time on it. I know that Maximum PC has done a fair number of uh, stories about the different netbook OSs, and maybe you should check that out. Uh, or if anybody in the audience has suggestions, then post it in the comments. Okay, so this is a huge question. This is the next one. It's about CPUs. Uh, there seem to be a wide variety of CPUs on the market, and the available info can be really confusing. That is definitely true. Uh, could you give a simplified overview of the major uh, Intel and AMD CPUs, the i3, i5, and i7 on Intel, and the X3 and X4 on AMD side? Um, I mean, you could literally write a couple of books about this topic. It is a huge topic. It's really super complex. There's a couple of key differentiators. One, on the Intel side, uh, there's the number of cores you have, uh, whether there's graphics that are integrated or not, that you built onto the CPU die. And then the last thing is hyperthreading. So hyperthreading is the technology that Intel uses that lets you uh, basically fake out a program into thinking that one CPU core actually can run two threads at a time, because typically you, you, know, you run one process thread for each core that you have in the CPU. Hyperthreading lets you use, um, say if you have a, a thread that uses a lot of floating point math and a thread that uses a lot of integer math, those are two separate areas of the chip, and they'll actually you know, let you run those two separate processes at the same time, even though that normally wouldn't work. Uh, so the, the breakdown is that i3 typically has integrated graphics on the die. It's usually bad Intel integrated graphics, nothing you can play games with. Not even that good for decoding video and stuff like that, but okay, it'll put pictures on the screen. Uh, those are very low end. Typically, the higher the number goes, the better the processor is. Um, I5 is kind of the intermediate, the mainstream enthusiast, but not super high end line. So it doesn't have hyper threading, but you will find quad cores where the I3s are only dual cores typically. Uh, I5s can be quad cores. I think there may even be some I5 dual cores, but I'm, don't quote me on that. The other difference is socket. So i3 and i5 typically go in socket 1156, which is the P55 chipset motherboard. Uh, i7 is socket 1366. For the most part, there are one or two i7 chips that are socket 1156 as well. So it's super confusing. So make sure when you're buying a CPU and a motherboard that you get the right socket on, for the right chip, especially on the Intel side. Um, the big up change from i7 to i5 is the addition of hyperthreading and higher clock speeds. So those will be quad and hexa-core CPUs that run at a lot higher clock speed and perform better and have hyperthreading involved. So uh, say you run a hexa-core, uh, you know, a six-core i7, it's going to actually show 12 cores in task manager or whatever. It doesn't always show a big performance boost, but it's much better in the current generation than in previous generations. There's also some differences in the way Turbo Boost works on the Intel CPUs. So um, you know, Turbo Boost is the technology that lets you uh, turn off unused cores when you're running single-threaded apps. Apps can only use one CPU core at a time. And uh, uh, they'll let you overclock the core that's being used so it runs you know, the default clock of the CPU is 3.3 gigahertz. It might run as high as 3.6 or 3.8 gigahertz when only one thread is being used. On the AMD side, it's a little simpler. There's not as many parts, and everything fits in the same socket. Everything's running AM3 Plus these days. Uh, it's a really straightforward design. Uh, X3 are three-core CPUs. X4 are four-core CPUs. And I think they have six-core CPUs as well. I, I, unfortunately, right now, AMD is a little bit behind on the performance compared to Intel, so we haven't spent a whole lot of time with them. Uh, you know, I, I, don't have, I don't take part in religious hardware battles, so we just recommend whatever's fastest. And... I mean, for the most part, like the AMD six-core CPUs can't compete with the quad-core Intels in most benchmarks. So, I mean, kind of stick with Intel right now is what we're saying. The good news is if you do want to buy an AMD machine, it's much simpler than the Intel side because there's only one socket, one CPU. Everything uses DDR3. You just, you know, buy whatever you think is interesting and put it together, and it should just work. The next question is about Android. My significant other just joined me in the Android world, coming from a first-gen storm to an HTC Incredible. She is not the biggest techie in the world and is a student, but is not dumb either. 
What kind of essential apps would you recommend for her? Uh, um, I mean, it depends on really what she does. I mean, I, I don't use that many apps. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely load up some games. I have usually a feed reader or something like that. I haven't found anything that I'm really in love with yet on the iPhone. Uh, we talked about Android apps a couple of weeks ago. I really love B-Tunes, really love Dogcatcher. Uh, I find that the default music apps on most Android phones are pretty bad. You know, they don't handle uh, compilation albums and things like that well, or gapless playback and all that. B-Tunes fixes a lot of those problems. Um, I like Twika for Twitter. It's a really good app. I know that a lot of people like Twitwa, the Frenchy, French kind of sounding Twitter app. Um, what else? It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically just use the apps that you need. And the nice thing about the Android Marketplace is you can try stuff, and if you decide within 24 hours that you don't want it, you can get a refund, and they, they'll, they'll you know, give your money back, and, uh, and you won't have to pay for the app if it's no good. So that's, I mean, I kind of recommend just going in willy-nilly and trying stuff like crazy on Android, and just, you know, as soon as you realize you don't want it, hit the refund button. <laughs> this is a geography question. Do you consider Half Moon Bay part of the Bay Area? You know, I, I, I kind of want to bring Norm in for this one, since he's a Bay Area native. Hey, Norm. Yeah. Um, come over here for a sec. Yeah. Norm says the answer is yes. Half Moon Bay is part of the Bay Area. Yeah, the answer is no. What? The answer is no. Half Moon Bay? It's South Bay. Yeah. It's on the peninsula. No. Half, okay, I'm getting shouts from the peanut gallery now. Bay Area? Yeah, it's on the peninsula. The Bay Area is big. Yeah. No. yeah. What about San Jose? No. What about Redwood City? No. It's on the bay. There's a lot of dissension. I think Half Moon Bay is in the Bay Area. Jeff thinks Half Moon Bay is in the Bay Area. Norm first thought Half Moon Bay was in the Bay Area, and then when popular opinion turned, he changed his mind, it seems. I think that anybody says Half Moon Bay is not in the Bay Area. It's 10 miles south of my house. I feel like I live in the Bay Area. So, you know, there you go. Screw you guys. This next question is dumb, just really silly. I ardently believe that there's no good Chinese food places. There are no good Chinese food places in the East Bay area. Do I agree? I don't really know because I don't really go to the East Bay that much. Um, I'm not going to ask any more opinions from the peanut gallery because I thought there might be a fist fight on the last one. Uh, but I, I, I have had good Chinese food in Oakland before, so there you go. The next question is about streaming video inside your home. Uh, we just bought an Xbox 360 to stream things, I assume that means video and music, to the back room. I think it would be more efficient to get a streaming device instead. Any tips on a WT WD TV, or should I wait for Boxy or something else, or Apple TV or ITV? Uh, this device must have Wi-Fi in it to reach back there. Thanks. Uh, I mean, we saw a whole huge rush of third-party streaming boxes like the WGTV, the Patriot box, the Asus box. Everybody made them because I think there was a, basically an inexpensive chipset they could buy that came with software and they could just put a box around it and sell it. Um, I mean, those are cheaper than an Xbox 360. They're not as functional. You can't watch Netflix on a lot of those, although that's definitely going to change in the next generation. I, I, I mean, if you have the 360, it's back there, it's set up, then, then stick with that. The, the third-party boxes do have better codec support and things like that. So you can play codecs that won't work natively on the Xbox, like MKV and, and some of the other more uh, popular codecs that are from the Internet rather than from places you may buy or rip stuff yourself. Hey, Will. I'm having problems with my wireless keyboard. When I play games, my character sometimes turns left for no reason. It's happened more than once and in more than one game. Should I buy a wired keyboard? What keyboard and mouse do you recommend for gaming? Um, okay, so this is really easy. Unless you're playing StarCraft and you're doing like 400 actions a minute and you're crazy and awesome, you don't need a gaming keyboard. I use a Microsoft Natural 4000 ergonomic keyboard. It's just because I like that keyboard. I mean, if you don't want to spend a lot of money on a keyboard, go out and buy a $15 Keytronics keyboard from Fry's or you know, wherever your local screwdriver shop is. Mice, I do like to buy a kind of nice gaming mouse. Um, I like adjustable DPI so I can really get my sensitivity exactly right and get one-to-one mouse-to-pixel action, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, for that, I, I mean, I like the, the Logitech G9X. It's kind of expensive. It's like $75, $80, I think, still. Uh, if you don't want to spend that much, the Razer Death Adder is a great optical mouse. It's really inexpensive, and it's ambidextrous, too. Or maybe they have left and right-handed versions. I can't remember. But it's a great mouse. Uh, it has adjustable sensitivity as well and is uh, one of my all-time favorite mice. So there's two good gaming mouse options on the keyboard. Just buy whatever you like and what you think looks good and, and what is going to have good action. But stay away from wireless for gaming because it just, it just can't keep up. This is, a, this is a good question about motherboards. It's, uh, what exactly is the difference between a high-end motherboard and a cheaper one? What sort of features will you usually be getting? Is it worth spending the extra money? Or will you be better off spending it on a better video card or more memory or a bigger hard drive? I mean, it really depends on what you want to do. A lot of the high-end motherboard features are specifically tuned to make overclocking easier. So you get more control over voltage on memory, CPU, uh, front-side bus, or, or QPI, whatever your particular board uses. Uh, you also get some kind of bonus features. You might have more SATA ports. So uh, where a pretty normal-priced X58 board will have six SATA ports, the $300 one may have eight or ten. Uh, I, I don't really feel like there's a whole huge advantage to the, to the expensive boards unless you are going to have a machine where there's a big window on the side and you want to see all the cool lights and stuff like that. Or if you're going to be overclocking, then, I mean, if you're, if you're a serious overclocker, then you can get a pretty significant advantage by getting one of the, one of the higher-end boards. But if you're just going to build a machine that's going to run at stock clock, I say go you know, mid-range to low level and you know, get, the, get a nice board in your chipset. I, you know, I'm running a P6T at home right now. It, it's been a great so far. I've been using it for about a week and a half since my Intel board conked out. And, uh, you know, it's, it seems pretty good. So, I, I, I mean, I don't think it's worth spending money on those on the fancy boards, unless you just want something that's fancy and has a whole bunch of extra features that you're probably never going to use. So that about wraps it up for this week's mailbag. Uh, as always, if you have a question, you can submit it by sending it to formspring.me slash tested. You can be anonymous, ask about tech, coffee, whatever you think is interesting. I'll read some of them on the air and answer them uh, every weekend. So for Tested, I'm Will. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week. Yeah. Um, <laughs>